five, but sometimes it takes a second. Going on a journey to the internet. <laughs> Okay. Hooray. We made it. All we are right. here in the internet on YouTube. Um, so we're about to get started with our Meet a Scientist chat with Adrian. We're going to be doing some really exciting illustration of dinosaurs, some paleo art, some adventures. Um, going to wait for more of our teachers to make it into our video. But thank you all for joining us. So far today, this is going to be fun. It's going to be so fun. When like throughout your life, especially as like a young and less artist professional, like what were your favorite things to draw or make art with? It was always dinosaurs. And but like as an implement, be like oh. a person, a marker person. I was obsessed with markers. I was. I always had pencils. Uh, markers and pencils were like my favorite things. Those I had always good. notepads and I just filled them up like crazy. My sister and I would sit at the kitchen table and just draw for hours. A lot of cartoons, a lot of dinosaurs, a lot of weird stuff. <laughs> Very we fun. Characters, we did all sorts of things. Oh, and it looks like Wadsworth STEM is here. Some third graders, hello, hello. Very nice. All right, well, I'll go ahead and do some introductions for Wadsworth and whatever other classes are here. Um, so my name is Anna Villani. I work in the Field Museum's Learning Center and I'm gonna be facilitating our chat today. Um, so if you've already figured out, hopefully there is a live chat feature. You're welcome to use that to submit questions or thoughts or comments. And I will be able to relay those to Adrian. Um, so if you have any questions about her background or what she's doing or how to draw a stegosaurus. Those are all great things you can put in the chat. Um, and I am here. Oh, and we also have Anna Cruz with third grade room 202. Hello, hello, more third graders. Well, I'm very excited to introduce our scientists for you all today. We have collections manager, Adrian Stroop, who knows so much about geology and so much about art. And we're gonna be exploring both today. Welcome, Adrian. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very excited to be here. And draw some dinosaurs. We're going to draw a stegosaurus today, which is a really fun dinosaur to draw. And yeah, let's get started. So I'm going to switch cameras and then you'll get to see what I'm drawing along with me. And if you guys want to draw along with me, then that's great because I'm going to kind of step you through this dinosaur drawing. So I'm going to start off with this is an outline of stegosaurus. And just to give you a little idea, if you're not familiar with this guy, but most people are, it's pretty recognizable. Uh, what I like to do is start with some basic shapes. So if the outline of the stegosaurus seems really complicated and you don't even know where to start, then I'm gonna help you through it. So if you could draw ovals and connect lines to other ovals, that's pretty much all you need to know. And so let's just jump right in. I am using cream colored paper today with a pencil, but you can use whatever you want. I'm going to draw this kind of darker than I usually would, but that's just so you can see the guidelines and stuff. And then if you have an eraser, that's going to help too. So, so let's just start. What I like to do first is start with a really large oval for the body. And it's okay if your lines aren't perfect right away. As you can see, I'm going over my lines quite a bit just to get loosened up and, and to get a nice, uh, nice, nice feel for the, the paper and the pencil. And sometimes I just like to make practice um, circles and things like that just to get going, just to kind of get in the mindset of making these Ovals. Yeah, I see you making a lot of small sketchy lines, which yes, a lot of flexibility versus making a really hard permanent shape, kind of building it out slowly. And exactly. So, yep, short sketchy lines. Go kind of light. I'm doing it darker just so it shows up better on the camera. But normally I'd be drawing much lighter than this. And uh, 
eventually we'll erase some of those lines. But I'm just kind of blocking in where I want the head to be. So this is part of the head. I'm going to go make the nose and then just connect those. You could even just draw that outside shape, but I think making more shapes is helpful because it doesn't make you commit to something right away. Like a big hard line would be very permanent and you just kind of want to go loose with it. Yeah. Um, so Leo was wondering what materials you're using to draw. So this is just a regular graphite pencil. It's a 4B. And so drawing pencils have numbers and letters to indicate how soft the lead is. So B is usually darker. And then there's H that's uh, lighter but harder. So I'm using a soft pencil. It's kind of dark just for the purposes of, of showing you guys what I'm doing. Um, I'll usually use like a, a lighter pencil. And this is a, a nice textured paper. This is actually uh, for pastels, but I didn't want to use bright white because it wouldn't show up that great on the camera. I thought like a, this is kind of like a cream color, but you can use whatever you have and pretty much any paper and pencil will work. And this is the eraser that I use. So it's really fun. And it's called a kneading eraser because you can kind of stretch it and knead it kind of like clay, but it's made out of rubber and it doesn't leave eraser shreds behind. So it's a really nice tool to use. And I'll show you how that works later. What's Rock great about- I was that, wondering, do you only draw animals that you work with? No, I, I draw pretty much anything. I'll draw stuff from memory. I'll make up animals. I'll draw from photographs. But uh, lately I've been trying to draw more dinosaurs that we have in our collection. So I, I chose Stegosaurus because if you get a chance to go to the field museum, we do have a, a cast of a Stegosaurus skeleton on display. So I like to feature the, the ones that we have in our museum, but not always. So I'm drawing the tail here. The key to making these shapes kind of flow together is like I'll, I'll attach the tail to the back part of the body come down here, make it all kind of fluid. That way everything kind of looks like it belongs together. So that's the tail. Stegosaurus is an interesting dinosaur because it has a really small head and it's gotten a lot of bad publicity or over the years of being kind of a stupid dinosaur because its brain is really small compared to the size of its body. So this, this guy was about 25 feet long, but the size of its brain was probably about the same size as a dog's brain. So if you can kind of imagine a huge animal with a tiny head and a tiny brain, but don't let that fool you because there's a lot of dinosaurs that were pretty intelligent. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and start with the legs here. I'm gonna do more ovals kind of in the middle and they're gonna extend down past the oval which is the body so here's the belly right here this will be the shoulder up here and go ahead and do that for the back leg And then I start the feet off as circles. And then you can kind of just make little lines to connect them. So those will be the ankles. And they have short little toes on their feet, kind of like hooves. The back leg is longer than the front leg. So go ahead and make an oval that's a little bit higher up. Here's where the hips would be. And then extend it down past the belly. Here's the knee right here. And then you can make two lines that go down where the calf meets the ankle. 
and some toes. It's kind of a nice thing. Uh, art and paleo go together really well because for my job, I'm studying the bones of the dinosaurs and other animals. But when I'm drawing, I'm kind of doing the same thing. Like I'm thinking about what body parts go together and how they're connected and what the animal looks like. Yeah, so kind of on that note, um, wondering what is your favorite part about your job? Oh, there's so many. I really enjoy uh, programs like this where I get to share my art and my excitement for science with the general public. So I like to do a lot of outreach. And uh, we have things at the museum like meet a scientist and members nights, stuff like that, where we get to interact with the public. And I really enjoy doing that because often I'm not engaging with the public. I'm just in the, my office and working on uh, just collections care. So I'm taking care of all the dinosaur bones and the skeletons, but it's most fun to actually like share that interest with people. Yeah, I, I'm definitely excited that you do that too. And um, speaking of the collection that you work with, Isabella was wondering if you have a favorite object from the collection. Well, there's so many. I, I here, let me just switch this back to me. So I really enjoy um, working with the fossil mammal collection. So it's a little different than working with dinosaurs, but we actually have a really huge collection of fossil mammals from all over the world. We even have some really early, they're not even technically mammals yet. They're like mammaliforms, which is a big word for, they, they're very similar to mammals, but they're so old that they're not quite true mammals yet. Uh, tiny little shrew-like animals that lived uh, during the Jurassic and Cretaceous. So animals that lived alongside dinosaurs, but were actually closer related to us. And those are kind of cool. So there's one called Morganucodon, which is a really fun name. And it was discovered in China. It has a really complete skull. And it had, and it's one of the earliest mammals to show the transition between reptiles and mammals. So we have bones in our ears and reptiles don't. They also have extra bones in their jaw. We have a jaw that's made out of one bone but reptiles had more than one bone. And over time with evolution, those bones, it's kind of a simplified way to say that they kind of migrated into the ear and became a more complicated ear for mammals, which is crazy. That's so <laughs> weird. It's so cool. Your so bones turning into ear bones. <laughs> uh, it was one of the earliest mammal-like animals to show that transition. So it's really cool. So things like that that show a transition between different species, it shows evolution kind of kind of an action like you can really get an idea of like these animals slowly changed or things were more favored and so those traits were passed on. Uh, evolution's really complicated, but you see things like that it makes it a lot more comprehensive. You can kind of yeah. understand it a little bit better. Yeah, so that might be a fun thing to draw. It's a really tiny little shrew-like animal. It's really cute. So since this is a stegosaurus, we're going to go straight into the, the plates on its back. And that's the most distinctive part about this animal. Love the plates. They're really cool. They had about... 17 to 22 plates on their backs. And there was a lot of debate over time about how they're oriented on their backs. So the name Stegosaurus comes from the Greek word stegos and soros. So it means roof lizard. And that is because when they first discovered Stegosaurus, they've these plates that were associated with it, they didn't know how they were oriented on the back. They thought they laid along the back, kind of laying down, kind of like tiles of a roof. And so that's how it got its name. And I never understood that until I looked up that story. 
I'm like, why is it roof lizard? That makes no sense. It is but, really weird. I'm like trying to think, because would that be kind of like if you armadillo it with the plates? Yeah, so that's kind of what they thought. They, it was like a really extensive armor. And they are related to other armored dinosaurs, but mm-hmm. I guess they just, it was such a strange thing to find that they had no idea how it worked until later the uh, paleontologists have found um, more complete specimens. And so they, they realized that they were actually oriented differently. There's been debate about if there is one single row of plates or two rows and whether they're parallel. So like the plates coming out like this, but they're actually staggered. So there'll be like one going this way and one behind it going this way. So they're kind of um, not parallel, but more staggered. That is really cool. And it's exciting always how we're like making new discoveries in science all the time. There are questions about um, you and science. So I, I think both of these questions go well together. One, let me see who asked. It. here Roberto was asking how did you know you wanted to become a scientist and then um, the Wadsworth third graders wanted to know why did you take a job as a scientist and not as an artist oh those are good questions so I've always been interested in dinosaurs and also just nature in general let's turn this back to me um, I've always loved animals and drawing and early on I just decided that it would be easier and I don't know more I'd be more successful finding a job as a scientist than an artist because it's hard to find jobs in art and but it's something that I never wanted to give up on and so I always wanted to somehow make that part of my life but up until my job, it was basically just a hobby. And I always wanted to be a paleontologist. I think I started when I was four, wanting to go on that path. And so it never changed. And I've just always been really interested in geology and biology. So it just kind of made sense. And it's just something that, I don't even know how it started, but it's just, it's always been that way. <laughs> and and uh, making a living as an artist, I was always told that it's just really difficult. So it actually made more sense to go into science, but in fact, they're n- neither of them are easy and, uh, but they're both really rewarding. So I went back to school to work as a museum person. So I, I got a museum degree and that was my way of trying to kind of meld both of my interests together. So working in a science museum, but doing artistic things and, uh, and then paleo art, it's just something I've always done, but never thought I could do it, you know, professionally, but it's just the perfect thing for me. So I'm glad that I'm able to use my art at work as well, because it's really not part of my um, main job. It's just kind of like a extra thing. Yeah, fun extra thing. Because I know I, working in education, we've like used your drawings multiple times in our programming or like asked if you could make us drawings of pterosaurs for yeah. so it's definitely helpful because Alice was also asking do you like working at the field or drawing more and it seems like you're able to do them both at the same time sometimes which is nice yes anytime I get to use art at work it's like the best day so when I originally decided to go into museum work, I thought I'd be working in exhibits because to me that was like the ultimate way to be creative and artistic in a museum setting, but kind of fell in love with collections management and just all the organization of things. I really enjoyed that aspect of the work too because I'm I'm very detail oriented and I really love lists and organizing and just kind of keeping things in order which some people find really boring but I really enjoy it so it was a perfect fit it's always good I yeah. feel like that would be why I am not a collection manager 
integrated organizational systems. A kind of like it's a particular type of job for a particular type of or like personality. <laughs> so if you guys are following along, I'm on, I'm just kind of going inside and erasing guidelines where I'm just left with the outside shape of the animal. So like all the circles, everything that's inside the body, like this line that disconnects the tail, we wanna make sure the tail is connected. So just kind of cleaning it up. Yeah, and there was also a question as you're cleaning it up um, from Roberto. Um, how did you become a great artist? Well, that's a hard question to answer. I practice a lot and I took art lessons. For, my mom is an artist. And I think that's where I got the idea of like, oh, that looks like fun. I want to try that. And I just started drawing when I was pretty young. In fact, I'm going to show you a drawing that I did when I was very young. Because it's a stegosaurus. I just started drawing and I copied things out of books. And so this is from one of my dinosaur books. I drew this when I was seven, which is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> I just copied it from a painting that I saw and I really liked it. And, but it was not easy. I remember having a lot of trouble with this back foot. And so my mom told me, oh, just put a plant in front of it. Just, you know, and uh, that's what I did. And so I've been taking art lessons I took art lessons with my mom's art teacher, like an evening course for adults, but I was eight when I started and I was the youngest student there. <laughs> and I took a lot of art classes in school, like in high school when you get to choose, um, like you, always, you can choose to take art classes or not. And so I took every art class that I could fit into my schedule. And I just practice a lot. It's just something fun I've always enjoyed doing. So the more you do it, the better you get at it. And I really just love the process of drawing, even if it's like, even if I don't really enjoy the outcome, I just have fun doing it. And so just that process is really enjoyable. Yeah, that's awesome. Like practice definitely is a big part of everything. And it is always good to enjoy both the journey and the hopefully also the final result. Yeah. It's kind of like practicing a musical instrument or just anything that, I mean, it, sometimes it comes down to just talent. Like if you have a, but I think it's more an interest in a really like, if you're really interested in doing something, you're gonna keep at it. Like I tried learning to play guitar, but I was not good at it immediately and kind of gave up. So I just kept on with the art and I realized that that's really my goal is to just improve my art skills. And uh, I guess the takeaway is that if you enjoy it in the first place, then you'll want to stick with it more. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, we are um, going to keep going until about 1.30. I know some of our school people have other classes and activities to get to, which is about seven minutes away, just so everyone knows. Um, but we do have always more questions. Luna was wondering if you have a favorite dinosaur to draw. Ooh. Well, my favorite dinosaur is Truodon because it's a small very smart dinosaur and I always thought that was kind of cool because when I learned about it it was probably one of the first dinosaurs to really change people's ideas of dinosaurs aren't stupid so I enjoyed drawing that because it's just like a graceful little creature and later we learned that it probably had feathers which I find really fun so I enjoy drawing Truodon, because it is my favorite dinosaur, but I really enjoy Stegosaurus and, and Triceratops and things like you know, dinosaurs that have a lot of interesting details, like the plates and Triceratops' horns, animals that have a lot of ornamentation. It's kind of fun. And they're yeah. just so different from modern animals that 
it's just, it's really exciting to draw something so unusual. Definitely. And speaking of those unusual plates, Alice shared um, that they think the plates are on the back to make them warmer and colder and they get to pick. Is that true? It's probably to cool them off. Although nobody's really certain if that's what it did. But so the plates are bony. And so that's why we know that they had plates because the bones preserved. But they probably also had a keratin uh, sheath, kind of like a cow's horn that made them even pointier and larger. And so they probably were, were good for cooling off the animal because they were big animals. And that is one of the oldest, probably the most um, recognizable hypothesis for why they had plates. They also think that they were probably uh, used for just display purposes. Um, it's not really sure. Kind of like uh, antlers on, on deer. So the males have antlers and the females don't. And we're not sure if, it's hard to know um, whether a skeleton is a male or a female just from the bones. So it's not, there's still a lot of debate, but um, I think mostly people agree that since the plates are very thin and fragile looking, they probably weren't for defense, but their tail spikes definitely were. So they had these very cool tail spikes. Mm -hmm. So they had a flexible tail so they could swing their tail around pretty easily and those tail spikes would be very deadly. Those are also bone that would have had a keratin horn over the, over the spike, kind of like a cow's horn. And they could swing their tails around pretty easily. Their back legs are longer, so their tail would be up more and so they could like smash it into an allosaurus's face or something. Very dangerous. Yes. Ferocious. Um, so there's a couple of questions that might be the same answer. Kennedy earlier on asked, what is your favorite animal to study? But Wadsworth Stim wants to know what your favorite animal is. So I don't know if you have a different favorite animal to study and like another one that's just a favorite for general purposes or if it's the same. Hmm. My favorite animals to study are hooved mammals. So they're called ungulates, kind of like horses and rhinos and deer and things like that. So I'm very interested in horse evolution and mammals in general. One of my favorite animals is the okapi, which kind of looks like a giraffe, but it lives in the forest and it's got stripes on its legs. So animals with hooves are my favorite and they're probably my favorite to study as well. That's really cool. Horse evolution is weird. It's all about losing your toes. Yeah. About it. <laughs> that was really fun. And I think there was another question. There's been a lot of really great questions and we can go back and any questions we missed, we can email out those answers if I miss somebody's. Um, so Santiago was wondering if you can just throw us some Sioux facts. Sure, I, I love Sue. So I have a lot of Sue facts that are kind of always on the tip of my tongue. So Sue is an interesting animal because Sue is the largest, most complete T-Rex ever found. And of course they keep finding more T-Rex skeletons. So someday that's gonna change and, and some people contest that now. They say that, oh, well, Scotty was another T-Rex that was found that's slightly more complete, but it's very uh, marginal. So the, the difference between those two skeletons is very small. Um, Sue is probably the oldest T-Rex ever found. Some of my colleagues were doing some really interesting science uh, looking at the uh, the growth rings in uh, Sue's femur. So they actually drilled a hole into some of the bones and they cut the fibula, which is another bone in the leg. They cut it in half and then they could make slides out of it and look at it under the microscope and 
kind of like tree rings, they're able to see the, uh, the growth lines in the bone. And so they think that Sue is 32 years old. Wow, that sounds old. really old. It's really old for a really large dinosaur. Let's see what else. Sue was found by Sue Hendrickson, and that's how Sue got their name. Um, but we don't know if Sue was male or female. So we just call them Sue, but we used they as the pronoun. But there's a cool thing that you can, you can learn from. So you can't really see if a dinosaur is male or female unless they're associated with a nest or eggs. But there are some skeletons of you know, fossil skeletons that they can uh, they look at the bones and they can see the change in the structure of the bones to see if it was uh, laying eggs because the, the, the calcium levels will change if a female dinosaur is laying eggs. And you can see that in her like, femur. And I don't know, I think there's been like one case where they were able to determine that a dinosaur was female based on that, but you'd have to be fossilized at the moment that you are laying eggs. So it's pretty rare. Yeah, that's definitely a, a unique moment. But it's cool, too, because that's something they figured out from birds, right? Like, the birds still do that today. Yeah. So the sort of connections are full of clues. So cool. Yeah. Of course, Sue is a theropod. So theropods were the dinosaurs that led to birds evolving. And it's pretty awesome that all the birds alive today are related to theropod dinosaurs. Well, we are at that 130 time. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge and your art with us today. Oh, I know it's the end of time, but also I forgot a question that I saw earlier that I was thinking about. If somebody asked if you had a favorite drawing, which I thought was an interesting question. Oh, a favorite what? Drawing that you've drawing. done. Oh gosh. Um, probably anything that I'm working on at the moment is kind of my favorite. Because um, I really enjoy just the process. Anything that has color, I like to do watercolors. Those are my favorites, probably. And so this is the uh, the color version of this Stegosaurus that I drew earlier this morning. I used pastels, which was kind of fun. It's messy, but it goes fast, and so you can add color pretty quickly. So, That's beautiful. Thank you. Love it. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for watching and listening. Um, we'll see you next time. And have a great rest of your day. Stay warm. Yeah. Like Saurus. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Uh, it's a great time to stay inside and draw. <laughs> yeah. So fun. If you drew along with me, that's great. We're just listening to some fun Stegosaurus facts. Yeah. Bye, everybody. <laughs>